The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Clearview Cyclones. See this right here? That's the Blacker House chair. I'm going to show you how I made it. Hit it! The Blacker House chair was originally built for the Blacker House in Pasadena, California. That was back in 1907. It's a very complex chair and it's been on my bucket list for years now. And I'll show you some of the details and you'll see why. The back consists of bent laminated slats and features a beautiful string inlay. The back legs curve backwards while also flaring out to the sides. The arms are not only curved but tapered in thickness and join up to the legs via long ebony splines. In traditional green and green fashion, there are ebony plugs everywhere, including in the sculpted crest rail. Brackets adorn the front leg to rail joints. The bottom rail features a small angled through tenon and each leg is given the classic green and green indent detail. Even if you don't like the green and green style, you have to respect the craftsmanship. Now to build a chair like this from scratch would take an insane amount of time, just developing the templates, getting all the measurements right, building prototypes, testing them, and then going back and building more prototypes. It's just something that unfortunately with my current schedule, there's no way that I could devote that much time to it. So I went to the William Eng School. It's one of the only places in the country that you can go to learn how to build this chair. And William has the process down to a science. All the jigs are there, all the templates are there, and you have the tools that you need to make it. It's the only way you can do it in that period of time. Even then, I still had to bring this puppy home and do the final assembly and all the finishing touches here in my shop. So it's quite an endeavor, but doing it this way was the only way that I could get it done. All right now, you'll have to forgive some of the filming that I did for this because I was busy building the chair. I didn't get to document every last detail like I normally would, but I still wanted to take the opportunity to bring you on the journey of building such a complex and amazing piece of furniture. So let's head out to Anaheim, California, where the William Ing School is located, and I'll show you how I built it. The eight-day class started with a review of the full-size plans, and then we got right to work with the sapelli wood, a species very similar to mahogany. First up are the front legs. These legs are unique in that they're shaped like a rhombus, so we need to make a couple of bevel cuts at the table saw. We cut one side, and then flip the piece around to make the second cut on the other side. You're going to see a lot of this bad boy, the JDS Multi-Router. It was introduced back in 1987 and woodworkers everywhere have been pining for them ever since. But with a price tag of nearly $3,000, it's out of most woodworkers' budgets. As you can see, it makes quick work of these angled mortises. We were also able to make the leg indents with the help of a positioning jig. And speaking of jigs, this project has a lot of them. Now the back legs need to be cut to shape in two dimensions and a template provides the guidelines. A quick bandsaw cut removes the bulk in one dimension, and then we'll use a jig and a pattern bit to bring the leg to its final shape. The bit isn't tall enough to do the work in one pass, so a second pass is done with a different bit using the first section as a guide. Before cutting the leg to final shape, we need to cut slots for splines. This is the spline that holds the crest rail to the top of the back legs. Now here's a look at the legs after final shaping. Now it's time for the arms. The shape is traced on using a template and then rough cut at the bandsaw. And just like the legs, the arms are rounded to final shape using a pattern bit. The arms were intentionally cut long so that we'd have an extra chunk of material left over. That piece is flipped to the underside and glued in place giving us the additional thickness we need with a near perfect grain match. The arms now need a taper from front to back, so we'll use a special set of jigs at the bandsaw. And just like that, the arms take shape. Now it's time for a little dry assembly. With the parts secured in place, the arms are scribed into the back legs for a nice stepped notch. A router is used to remove the bulk and a chisel does the rest. The end result is a very strong arm to leg connection that will be reinforced with a screw later. The arms now need to be cut to final shape using the bandsaw. The profile is sanded until it matches up with the front legs perfectly. Now that's what I'm talking about. Now using another carriage jig, the arms and legs are held in place while we use a slot cutting bit to create the grooves for the ebony splines. We'll need a groove in the front and in the back. 
The bent laminated back slats are made by resawing stock into thin sheets. Glue is then applied to each strip and the stack is clamped to a bending form. For best results, use a butt ton of clamps. The next day, the lamination comes out of the form and appears as one piece of wood. The shape of the back slats is traced on and the pieces are cut at the bandsaw. The through mortises for the bottom rail need to be clean and crisp, so we use the hollow chisel mortiser to make them. After the angle tenon is cut, it protrudes just slightly through the mortise. After cutting the mortises in the crest rail, we use the table saw to make the appropriate bevel cut. Now this is where things get pretty complicated. The slot for the splines has to be routed in two steps and at the perfect angle. With the help of a positioning jig, pneumatic clamps, and the multi-router, the results are as perfect as they can be. Now we can finesse the fit of the back slats. The slats need to be snug, but not too tight. To give the crest rail its unique profile, we'll use power carving tools. The crest rail is made to look as if it's folding over almost like a wave, so there's a lot of material to remove. A rasp does the final finesse work, and a random orbit sander makes everything nice and smooth. The center back slat gets some extra decorative elements like these square holes cut at the scroll saw, and a beautiful string inlay design. The template is glued right to the slat, and a small router bit is used to cut the grooves. Thin strips of maple are soaked in hot water and are gently driven into the slots with a hammer. Believe it or not, we're at day eight at this point and it's time to head home. Now back in my own shop, I proceed with the final details. Ebony plug holes are cut using Lee Valley hole punches. The ebony splines are dry fit and cut to rough shape. To simplify the assembly, I'll glue some splines in ahead of time. I then assemble each side of the chair separately and then install the arms and associated splines. Now I can bring the two chair sides together with the front and back rails. Epoxy gives me the extra working time that I need to get this glue up perfect. Clamps are then added with the help of custom angled calls. The back slats are now dropped into the back rail. And the tricky part, getting the crest rail aligned with five separate mortises. Now for the splines. As you can see, they're still oversized. We'll trim them to size after assembly. Now just a little downward pressure from the clamps keeps everything nice and tight. After the glue is dry, I use a block plane to remove the bulk of the ebony stock. And then I use a custom made double bearing bit that leaves the ebony just proud of the surface. Now for one of the more tedious details, the small blocks that go between the back rails. Each piece is beveled and custom fit to the appropriate location. But it's all worth it when you see the final pattern. Now it's time to install the corner brackets. They're held to one another with a small dowel. The same type of dowel is used to connect them to the chair leg and a little pencil dust on the end of the dowel helps me transfer the location directly to the leg. And glue is all that's needed to connect the brackets to the rail. Well, now it's ebony plug time. Each plug is pillowed over and polished from a long bar and then cut to size by hand. Each plug is then installed with yellow glue. The back slat gets a few plugs too, only these are made from walnut. As you can see, doing the plugs alone can take some serious time. The finish I'm using is lacquer, and I decided not to use dye on this piece. I think the natural look of the sapelli wood is going to be quite beautiful. I start by spraying the underside so that I can reach all of those nooks and crannies, and then I flip the chair over and focus on the most important and most visible surfaces last. Well, the lacquer is dry and the finish came out pretty nice, and if you take a look down here, you can see that I still don't have a place to sit. Uh, what I'm going to do is work with a local upholsterer to get a nice drop-in cushion put in here, and uh, normally I'd experiment with that stuff on uh, my own, but this is not the kind of project I want to experiment with. I want to make sure that seat looks just as good as the rest of the piece does. 
Now, whenever I come home from a woodworking class, I like to reflect upon what I've learned and not just individual techniques, but really the big picture stuff. Now, on a project like this, what it did for me was it ripped the veil off a chair building. In the past, I would look at complex chair designs and really have no idea how I would start that sort of project. I couldn't reverse engineer it in my mind. But by seeing a project go together from start to finish that's as complex as this one, a lot of those other chair designs look a lot simpler to me now. And I look at them and say, you know what, if I sat down, I probably could reverse engineer this and figure out how to build it. And that's an incredibly valuable thing. Now, of course, paying for this class, you really do have to think about um, the value proposition there. So yeah, I learned how to build this chair and I brought this chair home. That in and of itself could be worth the asking price, right? But for me, the bigger picture take home lesson is what I really paid for. The ability to build chairs and not necessarily be afraid of them. Because ultimately, and I've said this in the past many times, Everything in woodworking is just a series of steps. Some people know the steps and some people don't. So that's why you take a class like this, because it's a shortcut. It's a way to learn that series of steps so that you too can put that in your woodworking box of tricks and pull it out when you need to. All right? It's a very quick way to progress in your woodworking and really raise your game a little bit. All right? So if you have the opportunity to take classes, I know they're not cheap, but they truly are worth it. Do your research, go to a good school, get a good instructor, and I don't think you'll regret it. All right? So thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed seeing the Blacker House chair go together. I know I enjoyed making it, and um, well, I wish I could sit in it, but we'll have to wait a while for that. All right? Thanks for watching.